Thank you. Uh, if I could make a brief statement about issues raised in question time yesterday. I reviewed the Hansard. I said I'd come back to the Chamber. The first matter was about the direct relevance of a question from Senator McAllister to Senator Cormann. Um, in short, I have reviewed the Hansard, uh, and part of the question did ask the about the government's position. I believe the minister was being directly relevant to the question with the material he outlined in his answer. The second issue was raised during question time and then at the end of question time by Senator Watt, and it referred to um, claims made by a number of senators about comments made that may have been unparliamentary. I have reviewed the Hansard and I have consulted with the clerk. Um, I do not find anything in the Hansard that is an unparliamentary reflection or an unparliamentary imputation. Um, there are highly contestable matters in that uh, it, it recorded in the Hansard. Obviously, the Hansard does not necessarily record everything said in the chamber, and I would ask senators to be mindful of standing orders when uh, matters are disorderly, in a disorderly way, interjected across the chamber. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, this is probably not the time to dispute some of that ruling, uh, but I, I do want to place on record the opposition's concern with two aspects of that. First, in relation to uh, the uh, indication that a reference to government's position, you know, the government's position, can somehow render. Um, subject matter germane or directly relevant. I'm assuming or inferring that that only extends to subject matter that is somehow germane to the topic under debate. Quite, yes. okay. Quite right. Well, I, yes. Thank you, Senator Cormann. The second point I make, and I and I do, uh, uh, I'm not moving anything, but I am um, putting on record our concern with the ruling in respect to Senator Reynolds. It is an imputation to suggest um, that a senator is using uh, loss of life for political purposes. In fact, I can think of fewer, uh, more uh, egregious imputations, and that was the imputation. That was there were her words, uh, and I would ask you to reflect upon that. Uh, I, you know, we have a long-standing position of uh, respect for the president's position, but to allow a minister. Uh, to suggest that a senator in this place was using someone's death for political purposes is a highly egregious uh, position for her to take. I think unbecoming of a minister, uh, an indication of a glass jaw, if I may say. Uh, but but, uh, but I, I am I'm reflecting to you, Mr yes. President, from the opposition's perspective, substantial concern with the second aspect of your ruling. I take it no further than placing it on the hand side. I, I appreciate um, the, discre the, the discretion you've exercised there, Senator Wong. I'm happy to take submissions on specific words. The words I have in front of me in Hansard and which I have consulted with the clerk don't reflect the exact words that, 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 that you said there. There were different words used, which in my view are highly politically contestable. Some may consider highly unpleasant, um, but I don't necessarily consider it to be an unparliamentary reflection. Um, if someone used the exact words that you used there, Senator Wong, I, I may come to a different conclusion. Um, but I appreciate the support of the chamber. Um, I remind senators that this doesn't arise if we all are a little bit more careful with our language. And I will start question time now by calling Senator Smith. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, the Liberal member for North Sydney, Trent Zimmerman, said, and I quote, we have no commitment to fund a coal-fired power station, and I don't think we should. From my perspective, it's not the business of the Commonwealth Government to be building or funding coal-fired power stations. And yesterday, Liberal member for Wentworth, Dave Sharma, said on public funding of new coal-fired power generation that, and I quote, I don't think the government should be in the position of doing this. Does the minister agree with the position of his New South Wales Liberal colleagues? The minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, the government is not uh, funding a new coal-fired power station. Uh, the government committed at Order. the last election uh, $10 million to address supply and affordability issues for energy-intensive and trade-exposed customers in north and central Queensland. Now, these are industries like aluminium smelting, refining, cement, sugar and copper processing, all of which rely on low cost and reliable energy, employing tens of thousands of Queenslanders. Part of that commitment uh, was to fund a number of feasibility studies for new generation projects to ensure that these projects stack up and make commercial sense. 
Uh, we won't stand in the way of private sector investment, but uh, the investment the government is making is in relation to those feasibility studies as committed at the election. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. In an opinion piece to the Courier Mail, Senator Canavan said, and I quote, the Liberal National Government is supporting the development of a coal-fired power station at Collinsville in North Queensland. Will the minister rule out this government providing taxpayers' money to fund the construction of a new coal-fired power plant? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, I refer the senator to the answer I just gave the Senate, which detailed precisely what the government took the election and the government is doing precisely what we took to the election, no more, no less. Order. Senator. Order on my left. Senator Smith is on her feet. I will call her when I can hear her. Order. Order across the chamber. Senator Smith. The member for Dawson put out a media statement yesterday declaring that, and I quote, despite the claims of one inner city Liberal MP on Sky News this morning, the Morrison Liberal National Government is providing funding to coal-fired power projects. Is Mr Christensen correct? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, once again, uh, I think I have answered that question if Senator Smith had listened to the initial answer uh, or to the supplementary answer. And the government is doing precisely what we promised at the election in relation to the $10 million of funding for order. feasibility Senator, projects. Senator Watt, on, a, on a point of order? Ministers. O on relevance, the minister might want to avoid it, but this question is about comments of the member for Dawson. We haven't asked about them before, so he shouldn't be referring to previous answers. We want an answer to this question. Um, you've restarted the question. He has been speaking for 14 seconds. I am listening carefully to a specific question. I'll let the minister continue. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. The government uh, is delivering on our commitments for the dual feasibility projects in relation to the two, uh, the two projects under assessment there. Uh, and in terms of the work the government is currently pursuing, a decision that the government has currently made, uh, that is the extent of it, uh, and that is what we are delivering upon. Order. 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 On my left and. Senator Hughes. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is building a stronger economy and is delivering initiatives that are creating more Australian jobs? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hughes for her question. Uh, Mr President, on this side of the chamber, the government side of the chamber, we understand uh, the government's put in place the policies that employers are able to lever off to create jobs. And that is exactly what this government has been doing since we were elected to office in 2013. What we also acknowledge and put in place, though, are processes and procedures to ensure that people who are looking for work are actually connected with local jobs where near they live. Last Friday, I was able to join the member for Lindsay, here, here. Melissa McIntosh, at a job fair in Penrith. As, as Senator Payne would know, there was much needed rain Yes. in Penrith on Friday, but Mr President, I'm delighted to say that despite this, over 2,400 people came along to the job fair. This is 2,400 people actively looking for employment, putting their hands up and saying, we are ready, willing and able to undertake work. Mr President, job fairs are a practical way of connecting job seekers directly with not only employers who have jobs there on the day, but also with employment service providers, if you have any questions you might ask, but also it gives the job seekers the ability to ask questions face to face, and in particular to have their resume looked at, do you have the most up-to-date resume, but also to undertake a practice interview. We have a number of workshops. Uh, running throughout the day, and these are always well attended. Mr. President, since we were elected, to, since we were elected uh, into office, the economy itself has now created in excess of 1.5 million jobs. And, uh, in the last two years, we've held a number of jobs fairs around the country, and we've now had over 26,000 job seekers attending. We have a commitment to get more people off welfare and into work, and this Order. is exactly what we are Senator doing. Hughes, a supplementary question. Minister, why is it important to focus on helping Australians into work? Senator Cash. 
Well, Mr. President, as a government, we understand the benefits of work. We are focused as a government on growing our economy, getting more people off welfare and into work, but also delivering well-targeted social security, funded, of course, through a strong budget. A strong economy and a strong budget it allows you to do so many things. As I've stated, since we were elected to office, more than 1.5 million jobs have now been created. But on top of that, our strong economic management, led in particular by our treasurers, but also the Leader of the Senate, the, uh, the Minister for Finance, has now seen welfare dependency hit its lowest level in 30 years. And in fact, Department of Social Service analysis shows that proportion of working age Australians receiving welfare benefits has fallen to 13.5%. This is a decrease, Mr. President, of 100,000 of working-age people in receipt of income support Order. from Senator June Cash, 2018. Time for the Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister inform the Senate of the policy priorities of the government to continue to support jobs growth in Australia? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, again, on this side of the chamber, the government side of the chamber, we understand that you need to put in place as a government the right policy framework so that businesses can prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians, which is exactly what businesses are doing under this government. We have put in place a number of policies that are allowing job creation, including lowering taxes. Why are we lowering taxes? So that uh, both working Australians and small businesses are able to keep more of what is theirs. We are also focused on reducing the red tape um, and cutting through it via deregulation, access to finance and ensuring in particular that small businesses are getting paid on time. We are also ensuring that Australians uh, have the skill set that employers are telling us they need. We have also expanded—and I acknowledge the work that the Minister for Trade has done—expanded uh, our trade borders to make more markets and create more jobs. We are focused on jobs and we Order. will continue to put Senator in place Cash, the right time for policy. the answers expired. I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber and the gallery of a parliamentary delegation from Cyprus led by Mr Demetrius Silurus, President of the House of Representatives of Cyprus. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and in particular to the Senate. And with the concurrence of honourable senators, I would invite President Silurus to take a seat on the floor of the Senate. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Prime Minister Morrison has promised Australians a strong and stable government. Today, one Liberal MP has told the Australian that the Liberals' treatment of the Nationals was, and I quote, like appeasing a child who has a tantrum. This is what we have when doing, they've been doing for four years. The more they don't get their way, the bigger the tantrum is. How is the Prime Minister going to appease the Nationals this time? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. <clears throat> it's good to see how uh, the Australian Labor Party is asking the great questions about the future of our nation. About the future of our nation. Let me, and, and, I know, and I know, of course, uh, that the good Senator uh, is concerned. So let me reassure him that the Liberal National Party coalition remains strong and united and continues to deliver for the Australian people. Order. Continues to deliver for the Australian people. Uh, having taken over a government from the Labor Green coalition uh, that preceded us, let me tell you, we turned that uh, disastrous situation around that we inherited from you under your government, weakening economy, rising unemployment, a rapidly deteriorating budget position, chaos at our borders, forcing people to pay more for their electricity in order to send higher emissions overseas. I mean, it was a complete uh, your Order. last uh, Labor Green period in government was a complete failure. Let me tell you, the Liberal National uh, parties in government continue to deliver for the Australian people, continue to deliver a stronger economy with better opportunities for Australian families to get ahead and indeed uh, keeping our borders safe and secure. Uh, let me tell you, I put our record against your record, your Labor Green record, Order. any day, any Order. day, any day. 
and you can come I in here and ask juvenile uh, on university my left and my right politics typed questions you know what i actually given given that you used to be a national secretary of a great union the transport workers union i think you should be embarrassed that you've accepted that sort of question from your tactics committee senator sheldon a supplementary question <laughs> yesterday oh, sorry senator sheldon i'll, I'll wait oh for God. silence oh on go, my go, left go, go. and my right Across the chamber, Senator Sheldon is on his feet. Senator Sheldon. Yesterday, former Prime Minister Turnbull told journalists in the Marble Foyer that, and I quote, those people who are advocating that the government should fund coal-fired power are basically making the case for higher emissions and higher energy prices. And that is nuts. Does the Prime Minister agree with the former nuts. Prime Minister Turnbull? No. Senator Cormann. Um, thank you very much, um, ver thank you very much uh, Mr President. I, I thank you for the supplementary question. Uh, and I remember my time in the Turnbull uh, Cabinet when it, is, when it is that we initiated the underwriting investment in new generation Order. program, which was deliberately, deliberately technology neutral. Which was deliberately technology neutral. And it, it was actually during the Turnbull government that we thought very carefully about how uh, we would deal uh, with the clearly ongoing need for baseload uh, power into the future as part of an energy mix that includes an increasing proportion, increasing proportion of renewables. And of course, under our government, we are making record investments in renewables. We are also investing uh, in uh, the uh, major battery of the nation through Snowy 2.0. But we were always focused on making sure that there was the opportunity for appropriate investment uh, in uh, base load power generation that that was appropriately affordable and reliable, including, including in coal. That was what uh, accepting recommendations for the IEEE report was all about. Senator Cormann, time has expired. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. Senate Deputy Nationals Leader Matt Canavan tweeted oh. yesterday that the renewables are the dull bludgers of the energy system. Does the Prime Minister agree with Senator Canavan's comments? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I've actually uh, provided an answer on record in relation to this. Uh, I don't agree with that description. Um, I don't agree with that description. Uh, renewable energy is a very important part of our energy order. mix. But, but, but uh, in order to ensure that we can deliver affordable, uh, reliable energy supplies, we need to ensure that we continue to make sensible decisions about the entire energy mix, which will continue, which will continue to also rely substantially on Australian coal. And let me tell you, relying on Australian coal and demonstrating to the world how we are able to lower emissions uh, through higher uh, efficiency, uh, lower emissions uh, coal-fired power station technology, that will actually help reduce emissions around the world. Because if we displace brown coal, which is more polluting, uh, with uh, you know, high-quality Australian black coal into uh, Healy uh, plants, that is actually a good thing for the environment. And that is perhaps something, that's something that the Labor Party used to understand. Uh, and if you thought about it, you, you might get your head around it again. I was going to call. Are you on a point of order, Senator? Um, I think Mr. Minister's Mayor. concluded his answer. Senator, what? If, it, if it's a. You don't have the call, Senator. Senator, what? Good try, Senator Seawood. Thank you, Mr. President. Mis order. Can I hear Senator Seawood, please? Order. Senator Seawood has the call. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Minister, through you, Mr. President, my question relates to the opt-out provisions of the cashless debit card. According to the Department of Social Services' latest available data, so far nobody has successfully been exited from the cashless debit card using those provisions. To date, 635 people have applied to exit the card, yet nobody has come off it. Why has nobody been exited from the card yet? Would you expect that after more than six months of these provisions being applicable, that more people would have been exited than none? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank Senator Seawood for her ongoing interest in the cashless debit card and income management more generally. Um, the, the issue to which um, Senator Seawood raises in relation to the exit provisions that uh, have newly been put into place for people to be able to exit for a different reason than the harm that potentially could happen to people, the, social, uh, the, the psychological harm 
for people in distress. Uh, this is a, a different exit mechanism for the cashless debit card. Um, came about um, uh, through some legislation last year, uh, and we started the process of being able to enable people to contact the Department of uh, Social Services to seek to exit the card last year. Um, subsequent to having received a number of people who put forward uh, the request to be able to exit the card, uh, there was a number of quite complex pieces of information that were acquired, um, some of which were actually under the purview of the state and territory governments. Um, currently, we are undertaking um, the review of the request from those people um, who have requested to come off the card, um, and we will continue to work with the state and territory governments in the areas where the cashless debit card currently exists uh, to make sure that we have fully examined all of the criteria necessary to determine whether the aspects um, that we require, um, the government requires, the legislation requires for people to exit the card have been able to have been met. Senator C, what a supplementary question. I thank the minister for her answer, um, which doesn't Order adequately. Order on my left, Senator O'Neill. I can't hear Senator O'Neill. Senator O'Neill, I would like to hear Senator Seward's supplementary question. Senator Seward. Thank you, Minister. Through you, Mr. President, do you acknowledge that it is too hard for people to successfully meet the highly subject subjective exit criteria? Do you acknowledge there is a conflict of interest in having local, local partners provide assistance in completing exit applications? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and, and I thank Senator Seward for her follow-up question. Um, let's be clear. No, you, you'll make your, the inference that possibly comes from your question is that people haven't been able to exit the card. I have not said that. What I have said is that the process under which we need to undertake the assessment, working with various stakeholder groups, working with state and territory governments, working with local providers to be able to gather the information to determine whether those criteria have been met, has been complex. Um, so the process is ongoing. Uh, people who have made application um, will be assessed on a case by case basis, uh, and obviously processing times um, are going to vary between applications. Uh, so we will continue to work with the trial sites uh, and with, the, uh, with the, the, the local providers so that we can make sure that when we make the assessments to determine whether people uh, come off the card or not um, you know, in dealing with issues like um, you know, the, the drug and alcohol related issues, um, you know, crime, violence and anti statistics. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Seward, a final supplementary question. As I said, nobody has been exited from this process yet. When does the minister expect that a decision about even one application will be made? Senator Rustin. Look, thank you very much, and thanks, Senator Seward. Um, obviously, as I said, the complexity of this process um, is something that needs to be um, is going to take time. Uh, and when when we are in a position to have been able to make the assessment, and as I said, the difficulty we're working with state and territory governments, the, the difficulty in collating information from local community groups, um, the the difference between each of the trial sites has made this a much more complex process than we possibly imagined in the first place. Uh, but I can assure Senator Seward we have not refused people's um, exit. We are just merely going through the process of assisting uh, and making an assessment in relation to the criteria that's in the legislation as to the validity of their exit process. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My uh, question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash, and concerns biosecurity measures directed against the 2019 coronavirus, which has now claimed over 1,000 lives. Can the minister advise how many people arriving in Australia from China since the 1st of February have been the subject of biosecurity screening and advised to uh, implement self-isolation at home? How is the government able to confirm that incoming travellers are following self-isolation protocols and are travellers arriving from China under any legal obligation to comply with self-isolation guidances? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patrick for the question and for some prior notice. Senator Patrick, in relation to the details that I'm, I've been unable to get, I will um, seek to have them provided to you on notice. Uh, in terms of the latest data as at midday today, uh, approximately 42,723 confirmed cases and 1,013 deaths uh, have been reported globally. Of the 1,013 confirmed deaths, 1,011 have been from mainland China. 
uh, of the confirmed cases reported globally, the fatality rate is approximately 2 per cent. Uh, the Morrison government is doing everything in our power to protect Australians from the ongoing coronavirus outbreak. We've implemented enhanced border measures at international ports, including a direction to airlines and ships that enter Australia. Foreign nationals who have been in mainland China since 1 February inclusive will not be allowed to enter Australia. As a result, the overall total of arrivals since the 1st of February from mainland China is approximately 28,500. I'm advised that this represents a very substantial decrease in numbers arriving from mainland China. I'm also advised that this has not resulted in any significant increase through key transit points such as uh, KL or Bangkok, uh, indicating that the restrictions are proving effective. All arrivals undertake appropriate screening and are provided with information on the virus and what to do if symptoms present. These border measures are effective, uh, and since the 1st of February, 145 uh, China to Australia flights were cancelled. 30 arriving passengers had their visas cancelled. Of these, 19 visas have been reissued, resulting in a total of 11 visa cancellations. 234 passengers were refused permission to board their flight to Australia. 84 passengers in Australia have been refused permission to board their departing vessel. And, uh, I'll take on notice Order. any further details Senator Cash. for you. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank, thank you, Minister. Have any biosecurity con, uh, control orders been imposed in relation uh, to confirmed or suspected cases of coronavirus in Australia, and if so, how many? And in what uh, general circumstances would the government consider imposition of human biosecurity control orders to be appropriate? Senator Cash. Uh, Thank you, Mr. President. I am advised that on the 21st of January 2020, human coronavirus with pandemic potential was listed uh, as a listed human disease under the Biosecurity Act 2015, enabling the use of enhanced border measures. All states and territories have powers to issue orders under public health legislation that include provision for detaining persons and enforcement of those orders in relation to notifiable conditions. Authorised public health officers may issue directions to an individual, but generally chief health officers must authorise orders for detention. All states and territories have emergency powers, uh, which provides extensive authority to control a public health emergency, including the power to detain individuals. In such cases, the emergency direction must be authorised by the chief health officer or, in some cases, the minister. However, once declared, authorised emergency officers may have delegated powers and the agency to detain individuals. The Commonwealth can issue directions during a human biosecurity emergency under the Biosecurity Order. Act. Order. Senator and again, Cash, time any further for the information answer has that expired. I can get you. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Minister. Will the government undertake to promptly pub publish general details, being the numbers and broad locations of any human biosecurity control orders imposed in relation to the coronavirus? And will the government undertake to provide an update, uh, a weekly update to the chamber on uh, its measures in relation to the coronavirus? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you. And um, I believe that Minister Hunt has already done his first press conference for the day in relation to this issue, when we are obviously providing regular updates both to the Parliament, uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate, and to the Australian people. Uh, information is being shared through the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee and other relevant forums. Importantly, the National Incident Room is working with all states and territories to facilitate contact tracing of any individuals identified uh, as being at risk of exposure uh, to the virus on incoming flights. This includes contacting individuals in close contact with any confirmed cases and providing other passengers with advice on what to do uh, if they begin feeling unwell. We are meeting all requests of state and territory governments as promptly as we can. And, uh, as you would understand, this is an evolving situation and we will continue to follow the expert medical advice. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Cole Beck. Oh, Yesterday, I asked the Minister about the Prime Minister's media release dated 30 March 2019, which stated, and I quote, further details on the change room and swimming facilities fund will be released later in 2019. I asked the Minister again 
Were these further details ever released? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, President. Thanks, Senator Farrell, for the question. Um, I'll, I, I haven't seen any further details of that particular program uh, being released. Order. Uh, after, after, the, after the election, Mr. President, after the election, uh, the government made a decision to uh, allocate projects, 41 projects, as we discussed in the chamber yesterday. Uh, to that particular program for administration, uh, and the administration of that program was, uh, was uh, moved from the Department of Infrastructure uh, under the uh, stewardship of the Deputy Prime Minister uh, to my portfolio. Um, uh, since the program has been in my portfolio, there have been no further information uh, released in respect to the program, uh, because at this point in time, the responsibility that I have, uh, along with my department, is to administer the um, uh, delivery of those election commitments that are now a part of uh, the uh, female facilities and water uh, program, that's um, the FFW uh, safety stream program, uh, Mr. Pro Mr. President. Uh, and so the, uh, the election intervened in that process. Uh, the allocation of the, pro the grants or the, the election promises uh, was made to that program, and they now rest with my portfolio for administration and delivery. Senator Farrell, supplementary question. I do thank you, uh, um, Mr. President. Uh, yesterday, the minister refused to advise the Senate whether his agencies had expressed concerns that no guidelines or further details were ever distributed, despite the Prime Minister stating that they would be. I ask again: Can the minister assure the Senate no concerns were raised with him? Or his office about the failure to distribute further details or guidelines. Senator Colbeck. Mr. Mr. President, as I indicated yesterday, all of these projects were election commitments. Uh, we made a number of election commitments for sporting projects. Order. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Uh, I know that the minister is simply repeating the script that the leader of the government has given him on, uh, in the chamber. But I, my point of order is direct relevance. We did not ask about. Uh, guidelines. We did not ask about election commitments. We asked about an answer the Prime Minister gave previously in relation to advice from agencies. And I would ask you to ask him to return to that question. The Minister has been speaking for eight seconds. I appreciate it was a specific question that related to advice received or not received, and the Minister needs to address that particular question. Um, he has only been speaking for eight seconds, so I'm going to grant him a couple of sentences at the very least before I make a judgment on direct relevance. Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I was saying, all of the projects, all of the projects that are being administered under this program were election promises. And as I indicated to the chamber yesterday, as I indicated to the chamber, uh, because the delivery of these projects is very similar to the way that uh, CDG projects are rolled out. The, the department has decided, expressed no concern to me, Senator Farrell, uh, to use the guidelines for the delivery of CDG projects for the delivery of this program. So, Mr. President, uh, no concern from my department to me around how these program, this program might be delivered. The government made a decision that the Department of Health would deliver these programs uh, rather than the Department of Infrastructure. And the Department of, Infra uh, Department of Health is utilising the Department is the utilizing has expired. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. I do have a further uh, supplementary question, Mr President. Yesterday I asked the minister to explain why $150 million of taxpayers' money is being allocated without any guidelines. I again ask the minister why was the $150 million of taxpayers' money allocated without any guidelines? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, as I've said a number of times already, the projects being delivered through this program were election commitments. It's that simple. The opposition delivered $250 million worth of election promises. $250 million worth of election promises, Mr President. Um, with, 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 a, with, a, with a line in their with a line in their election policy document to increase that to 400 million dollars mr president 
Where are the guidelines? Where are the guidelines for the Labor Party's election commitments, Mr. President? Where are the guidelines for the Labor Party's election commitments? This government, this government made a number of election commitments, 41 of them, in fact, that have been delivered through this program. The Labor Party made uh, $250 million worth of election commitments. Uh, no guidelines. Uh, no process. They just made their $250 million worth of election commitments. Uh, they would have had to have a program to deliver it just the same way the Order, government does. Senator Colbeck. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's plan to provide pathways from welfare to work is building a stronger economy and creating more Australian jobs? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank the senator for his uh, question and his ongoing and enduring interest uh, in our social welfare system. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to update the Senate on the government's progress in building a stronger economy and, uh, and creating more jobs. Um, and we have absolutely focused on the economy because getting more people into work and delivering a well-targeted and sustainable social welfare system uh, funded through a strong budget is the only way that we can continue to grow our economy and provide jobs for the people who need them. And as my colleague mentioned earlier, uh, and in conjunction with the work that I do with Senator Cash as the Minister for Employment, uh, working hand in glove to identify the barriers for people to actually get into employment at the same time as creating jobs to make sure that when we break those barriers down, the jobs are there. And as the, Senator Cash mentioned, um, we have just announced uh, to the 30th of June 2019 that the number of working age Australians or the proportion of working age Australians who are dependent on welfare has fallen to 13.5 per cent. That is the lowest level of dependency for over 30 years. 30 years. Um, and when you combine that with the job creation programs of this government, that are creating jobs so that when people find themselves in a position to move into employment, the jobs are there, we actually have got a formula that means that more Australians are in work. So as more people are finding employment, we are seeing a corresponding uh, fall in the number of working age Australians on welfare. And since 2013, 1.5 million jobs. I mean, those opposite can sit there and scoff and they can interject, but 1.5 million jobs created for Australians so that they can get into work. So as we sit here today, we continue to understand that there are people with barriers that, that to get into work, and we're working on innovative programs such as the Try, Test and Learn program so that we can identify the unique reasons why sometimes people find it more difficult to Order. get into work. Senator Rustin. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Why is it important to reduce welfare dependence and promote self-sufficiency and resilience? And how does welfare dependency at present compare to previous terms of government. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Sullivan. Um, the underlying objective of our welfare system is to support Australians who find themselves in a position where they're not able to support themselves. And by moving people from welfare to work obviously strengthens our communities, it strengthens our economy, but it also is of extraordinary benefit and value. Uh, to the person themselves when they get a job. Every person who is on welfare who gets a job is a victory for this system. Um, but it's also imperative that the long-term sustainability of this system uh, is protected because that protects our community at large and ensures that there will be a system in place for them and for our families and, their, and, and our children. Um, in June 2019, there were 2.2 million Australians of working age receiving income support. This is a decrease of 100,000 people from June 2018. Uh, over the same period of time, the working, uh, working age Australian population aged 16 to 65 Order. also Senator increased. Rustin. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, can the minister update the Senate on how a sustainable welfare system supports Australian families and retirees? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. As those in this place would probably know, and if they don't, they should, one third of the Australian government's budget is, uh, is targeted to our sustainable but targeted welfare system. And this includes payments to a range of people. Uh, they include um, $48 billion that go on, uh, is spent to support our older Australians with the age pension, $18 billion on family tax benefit, 
$9 billion for carers, amongst others. Social services touches almost all Australians at some stage during their lives, and it is a safety net to make sure that we provide for those that are most vulnerable when they are vulnerable. And it's particularly important that this system remains sustainable because we need to make sure that this system is in place not just for Australians today but for Australians into the future. And I'm sure those officers would like to think that this system would be sustainable should their children or their grandchildren ever need the safety net that is applied Order, and Senator provided O'Neill. by this system. Order, Senator Rustin. Time for the answers expired. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Minister Reynolds. Minister, my question refers to the announcement of 10 new case coordinators for the Department of Veterans Affairs Coordinator Client Support Program. The government's made quite a point of saying the case coordinator roles is about providing at-risk veterans a single point of contact to, contact to work with throughout all the complexity of the Department of Veterans Affairs. There's definitely value in having one person you can actually trust to work with who helps you throughout your transition into civilian life. But you don't want your single point of contact leaving just before they're on a short-term contract and they're not renewed. Will you commit to making sure that none of these case coordinators are external contractors? The Minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Lambie for her question on this uh, announcement. And I also thank you, Senator Lambie, through you, Mr President, for your ongoing uh, advocacy and support for so many of our veterans. So I thank you for that. Uh, in relation to the announcement of the additional case workers, I can confirm that well, one is that we are we are doing this, and the reason that we're doing this for is veterans under the age of 30, as you know, as you well know, are, who are involuntary discharge at a higher risk of suicide than the general population which is why we're investing the $4.8 million that you referenced to, to ensure that young and vulnerable veterans uh, who leave the ADF will be provided a single point of contact with 10 additional case coordinators and also the coordination client support, uh, which is already helping well over 1,000 veterans. In relation to who will be used, Senator Lambie, I will have to take that on notice and I'll endeavour to get back to you straight away. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The average length of time a veteran stays in the coordinated client support program is about 275 days. What guarantee can you give to veterans who are going to have to deal with more than one case coordinator simply because the government thought that's the cheapest way to do it? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Senator Lambie. And I just have to take issue with your last comment, and I don't uh, in any way agree with your characterisation. And I'll take that specific notice on question as well to get you the right information. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. You think the easiest way to make sure veterans have one single point of contact across their time in the program would be to have their case coordinator to be on staff as a permanent employee. So why have you created this revolving door of bureaucrats on tap by cutting DVA's APS staff by 15 per cent in the last four years? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and again I thank Senator Lambie. Uh, Senator Lambie, I, in relation to that last question, um, again I reject uh, the premise of uh, your question, but I will take that also on notice. But I would also extend through you, Mr. President, the opportunity for a meeting with uh, Minister Chester to actually discuss your concerns in relation to who those people will be. Thank Senator you. Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. I refer to the party political advertisement published on the Prime Minister's social media channels at the height of the bushfire crisis that was authorised by, and I quote, S. Morrison, Liberal Party, Canberra. Did the Minister authorise the use of video footage containing Australian defence personnel and assets in the Liberal Party's party political advertisement? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, Senator Kitching, for the question. Uh, the answer is very simple. is That was the legislative requirement uh, to go on, on that ad. Order. Order. Um, Senator Reynolds, have you concluded your answer? There, there is an opportunity to debate questions. There, Senator Kitching has an opportunity for supplementary questions. Senator Kitching. 
Who authorised the use of video footage which contained Australian defence personnel and assets in the Liberal Party's political advertising? When was that authorisation granted? Senator Reynolds. Uh, Senator Kitching, thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Uh, in relation to that question, I'll have to go back and have a look to exactly which photos you're referring to, because as Senator Kitching would be well aware, there's a gallery of photos available on the website for people to download and use. So, so I don't mislead. So I don't mislead the Senate. I'll go and seek some further in information on that, and I'll get back to you. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you. The Australia Defence Association Executive Director Neil James has said that the ad was plain wrong and broke long-standing conventions on the use of the Australian Defence Force in advertising. How do you respond to Mr James? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you. And again, I'll just point out that what, what, else, uh, what else he has also said about the Australian Defence Force contribution to the bushfires. So that has been order. an amazing. Senator, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order is direct relevance. We all support what the ADF has been doing. That is not the question. So I would ask the minister not to cloak herself in the ADF's courage in these circumstances. We are asking this minister how she responds to Mr. James's criticism of the political use of these images. Um, on, on the point of order. Um, the question was specifically about um, comments regarding an advertisement. Uh, and the role of the ADF, and the minister to be directly relevant must relate to those elements of the question. Senator Reynolds. Uh, what I would remind those opposite is that it was uh, it wasn't a it wasn't a ministerial or it wasn't a prime ministerial, as I understand the piece that you're referring to. It was required to be authorised, and it was authorised. It was not a piece of material from myself uh, as the minister. So. I will take that on notice, but I'll take it on notice. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister outline how the Morrison government's $76 million bushfire recovery package is helping to support affected communities? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator McGrath for his question. Uh, a passionate Queenslander with, of course, a passionate interest in the tourism industry, and I thank Senator McGrath in particular for uh, the many representations and feedback that he's been providing to me in terms of uh, the impact, especially of coronavirus, but also of reputational impact in relation to bushfires on Queensland tourism businesses, as have so many coalition members. Uh, Mr President, uh, the government, uh, as is well known, uh, has applied a $76 million uh, step up in terms of tourism funding. Uh, many have commented that this is, uh, so far as they are aware, the single largest additional investment made in Australian tourism by an Australian government in terms of support uh, for recovery uh, during this time. In implementing this package, uh, the government is seeking to activate increased domestic tourism through a $20 million campaign. Uh, and we are particularly working to help uh, states and territories uh, who will receive the bulk of that $20 million funding. Matching money is on the table for those states and territories, so they step up and put in extra money. We put in extra money. Uh, we will also today release guidelines for the Regional Grants Program. The Regional Grants Program is a $10 million component of the $76 million package specific for fire-affected communities. Those communities are in a position to be able to invest in regional events, in other promotional activities, uh, and quickly secure grants under this program to be able to lift and boost visitation, especially during non-peak periods. And those non-peak periods uh, are important to make sure that we lift and make up for the lost visitation that has occurred and is occurring. And is occurring, Mr. President. We note that the ongoing impact of the coronavirus has had a continual slowdown impact on many regions across Australia, including some of those fire affected regions. That's why it's important we get the investment of this funding absolutely right. Order. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister advise the Senate on what steps the government has already taken so far to assist the tourism sector in response to the challenge of both bushfires and coronavirus? Senator Birmingham. 
Mr. President, as I indicated, uh, the $20 million funding, uh, the bulk of that is available for the states and territories. Uh, I welcome those states that have made the decision to put in matching funding. I welcome those states that have put in matching funding, uh, which of course helps to nearly double the commitment uh, that is there in terms of the partnerships that exist. Welcome the fact that companies such as Qantas, Virgin, Jetstar, AAT Kings and Ridges have all come on board and are partnering with Tourism Australia uh, in seeking to drive sales and products uh, to help lift travel across Australia. Uh, I note the fact that the Holiday Here This Year campaign is featured on cover wraps across 24 Australian newspapers, 376 advertising panels, 53 airport screens, uh, advertisements in over 600 office towers, broadcast on radio nearly 3,000 times and a bonus of 12,500 free charge spots. And I thank uh, many Australian media outlets for providing free or discounted space to be able to help us get campaign reach further and drive pa taxpayer dollars further in our support Order. for tourism businesses. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister inform the Senate how the government's tourism package is being responded to in market? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, it is, uh, it is early days still, and we know uh, that in terms of uh, recovery in those international markets, we see globally downward trend in terms of international travel. Uh, this is not a problem just affecting Australia, it's affecting uh, visitation and travel right around the world as a result uh, of coronavirus. Uh, I heard uh, interjections before from those opposite, and uh, uh, certainly when, uh, when uh, I was on the south coast of New South Wales uh, the week before last, uh, talking to tourism providers there, I know they are hurting. Uh, they are hurting intensely. Uh, and let me make it very clear, Mr. President, uh, they're hurting for a range of reasons that uh, some of those opposites seem to ignore. Uh, the fact that still getting road access from Victoria up into some of those south coast communities has been an ongoing work uh, is a real problem. We have been offering additional resources to the Victorian government to get those roads open. Uh, and frankly, those opposite ought to deal in the reality of the challenges that are there. Order. Uh, we are Senator working. Birmingham, time for the answers expired. Senator Ayres. Uh, Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Yesterday, the minister told the Senate that, and I quote, I think you will find that the majority of Australians impacted by these bushfires have been very happy and grateful for the response by this government. Megalong Valley resident Glenn Delane has been told she's not eligible for bushfire recovery assistance despite her smoke-stained home. After facing drought and bushfires, she's now in a perilous financial position. Is the minister really saying that Ms Lane should feel happy and grateful for the assistance that she's received? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Ayres, for your question. Um, I think if you actually listened to what I said yesterday, I said that the majority of Australians are very happy with the response that has happened, not just by the federal government but by state governments as well, in relation to these unprecedented disasters that have occurred. In relation to the specific example that you have raised, as I said yesterday in response to a question very similar to the one that you've just raised, if you have a particular individual who is experiencing particular difficulty, we are more than happy on a case-by-case -case basis to actually look at the circumstances around that particular case to see whether they are able to be uh, to support it. And I think, um, you know, I'll take um, Senator Watt's interjection. I think the Australian public in general, particularly those that have been affected by bushfires, uh, have actually been very, very grateful for the response that they've received across the board from state governments, from uh, across uh, the many states that have been impacted by bushfires. The response, I, I have to say, seeing the military walk off the aircraft on Kangaroo Island, I've got to tell you, the Australian government's response by the ADF, and I thank Senator Reynolds for the response yeah. post that she put into place, um, watching the faces of people on Kangaroo Island who'd lost their houses, lost their farms, lost their livestock. When those boots got on the ground on Kangaroo Island, they were very, very grateful. So I can assure you that my statement to the House yesterday, to the Chamber yesterday, was absolutely accurate. I do believe the majority of Australians who have been impacted have been grateful for the response they've received across the board. However, however, there will be individual circumstances, possibly like the one that Senator Ayres raised in his question, that we would be more than happy to take on and have a look at on, on a particular case-by-case -case basis so that we can have a look through the recovery process, both state and federal, to see whether there are other things that are available to the constituent to which you refer. 
Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. A month after losing his home in the bushfires, Waitalaba Rural Fire Service firefighter Joe Borger had only received a disaster recovery payment, was still waiting for other funding approvals and was forced to accept donations from neighbours just to keep going. Is the best advice this minister has for Mr Borger really just to be happy and grateful? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Senator Ayres, I mean, you do a disservice to this place and yourself by making a comment like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, you know, the, reality, the reality of this Order. is it's an unprecedented, yeah. absolutely unprecedented Order disaster. On my left. And there are, have been hundreds of thousands of Australians who have been out there working on the fire front, our, our firefighters, our emergency service workers, our defence forces out there helping, helping Australia. Order. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. Could this minister not hide behind the goodness and courage of other Australians order. and respond Senator, to her Senator happy Wong, and grateful Senator lecturing Wong, of Senator Australians Wong, in Senator this chamber? Wong, that is not a point of order. Oh, Senator Cormann. That was my point. I, mean, I think, I think, and I would like you to reflect on this. I think that uh, on many occasions now, instead of raising a point of order, uh, Senator Wong raises the biting points. Uh, I mean, that is obviously disorderly. And, and I think she should be called to order much quicker. I'll take that submission. I was attempting to call Senator Wong to order. On the point of order, questions that are highly political, politically charged, the minister is entitled to address them um, in a manner that the minister sees fit. It is not appropriate to call a point of order for an answer someone doesn't like when there has been a politically charged question. Senator Rustin to continue. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. And, uh, and I, I've just give me the opportunity to update the Senate on, on some of the activities that have actually been undertaken as part of the, the bushfire recovery. Over $121 million has been paid to families and individuals. Uh, over $155 million uh, has been paid to 88,900 eligible individuals in disaster recovery payments and allowances. Um, we've paid $5.2 million have been paid to 1,500 volunteer firefighters. Uh, and almost 300,000 has been paid to the 23 applicants under the expansion of the community Order. childcare Senator fund. Senator Rustin, time for the answers expired. Senator Ayres, a final supplementary question. Members and senators are hearing from countless Australians in areas devastated by bushfires, frustrated about inflexible uh, government bureaucracy and severe delays in receiving assistance. Why is the best this minister can say to Australians struggling in the aftermath, aftermath of the bushfire crisis simply to be happy and grateful? Senator Rustin. Well, I'll just take the, 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 the premise of, of the comment that's just made there. I did not say yesterday that Australians should be happy or should be grateful. I've said the feedback that I received on the ground for the majority of people that I have encountered since I've been out on the bushfire fire grounds has been that they are grateful for the response that they've received from the federal government and the state government and their communities, their local governments. So I think to come in here and seek to misrepresent me um, is not doing you any service. However, however, um, what I would say, um, Senator Ayres, is Order. that— oh, sorry. Order. I'd uh, like to hear the minister's answer. Yeah. What I would say, Senator Ayres, has been that the response to these unprecedented fires has been unprecedented in itself. Uh, the first time that the military has been called out in the kind of degree that it has, this is the first time the federal government has had to stand up a national bushfire recovery agency, and there have been an absolute myriad of programs put in place, including the $2 billion made available by our good economic management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Senator McLaughlin. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, this is not my first speech. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Australian Defence Force is working with its partners to support maritime security in the Middle East? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Order, Senator Stirl. Thank you very much, Order, Mr President. Senator and I thank the Senator for, for his uh, first question. Uh, on 13 January, I farewelled HMAS Toowoomba and her crew of 190 personnel on a six-month deployment to the Middle East under Operation Manitou. And I am very happy to report to the Senate that they are already doing our nation proud. Manitou is Australia's longest standing commitment to maritime security and stability in the Middle East. And uh, this is not a new mission. HMAS Toowoomba is in fact the 68th Royal Australian Naval deployment to the region since 1990. HMAS Toowoomba commenced operation on the 31st of January 
and has already conducted a transit of the Straits of Hormuz with the United Kingdom's Royal Navy HMS Defender. But throughout her deployment, she will be dual uh, assigned. She is also supporting the Combined Maritime Forces, which is a 33-nation partnership which is targeting terrorism, piracy, drug smuggling in the Middle East region and also on the, co east, the northeast coast of Africa. She is also supporting, as I've said, the International Maritime Security Construct, a broad international effort designed to protect freedom of navigation and support the safe passage of commercial shipping and maritime trade in the region. Australia joined the IMSC in mid-2019, forming a series of security, uh, following a series of security incidents uh, in the sh against the sh uh, shipping in the Straits of Hormuz. And under the IMSC, HMAS Toowoomba is working with international partners to secure trade and energy flows throughout the Middle East region by ensuring the safe passage of commercial and also civilian vessels. When operating in support of the IMSC, Toowoomba will coordinate with a complementary European-led maritime surveillance mission in the Straits of Hormuz. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can the minister provide an update on how Australia's support to the combined maritime forces helps to counter terrorism and narcotics in the Middle East? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Again, I thank the senator for his question. While supporting the combined maritime forces, HMAS Toowoomba will assist with the interdiction of illegal activities that fund terrorism. This includes the movement of personnel, weapons or income generating narcotics and also at charcoal. Since 2014, the Royal Australian Navy has seized in excess of 9.6 tonnes of heroin, 58 tonnes of hashish, 15 kilograms of methamphetamines and also 35 kilos of amphetamines, with an estimated combined street value in excess of $6.2 billion, as well as approximately 2,200 illegal weapons with over nearly 500,000 rounds of ammunition and more than 12 tonnes of precursor chemicals required to manufacture explosives. Through these efforts, Australia has helped deny terrorist organisations crucial weapons and also revenue. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. Uh, can the minister explain to the Senate how Australia's contribution to the international maritime security count construct supports Australia's economic and security interests? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Maintaining vital trade and energy flows through key choke points, like the Straits of Hormuz, is crucial to the global trading system and also the international economy and also Australia's prosperity. Around 40 per cent of fuel used in Australia transits through the Straits of Hormuz and is either refined uh, here or overseas. The international maritime security construct seeks to provide freedom of navigation through these shipping lanes which reach directly into the Indo-Pacific region and well beyond. Under the IMSC, HMAS Toowoomba will work with international partners to monitor and deter destabilising activities which could disrupt trade and also vital energy flows. She will also support the safe passage of commercial and civilian shipping in the region. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. When was the last time the minister tabled a report by the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet relating to ministerial standards that had been considered by the Governance Committee of Cabinet? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. We don't um, table those uh, reports in relation to—I mean, the Governance Committee of the Cabinet considers these reports uh, in relation to serving ministers, in relation to serving ministers. Uh, and and uh, well, she was a serving minister at the time, and that, of course, obviously, the deliberative process of the governance committee led to the outcome that is uh, now well known. I suspect that you uh, might uh, want to refer uh, to uh, two former ministers who had long left the parliament, and that is not the same process. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Given that on the 22nd of July 2019, the minister tabled a report of the Governance Committee of Cabinet by then Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Dr. Martin Parkinson, relating to ministerial standards, 
What is the real reason he will not release the report by the Prime Minister's former Chief of Staff, now Secretary of his Department, into the breach of ministerial standards by former Minister Senator Mackenzie? Senator Cormann. Um, I, I don't accept the premise of the question, but in order to ensure, in order to ensure the bit relating to the uh, Governance Committee of Cabinet, I will, I will clarify the facts and I will get back to the Chamber on notice. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Given the clear precedent for releasing such reports, why won't the Minister come clean with the Senate and the people of Australia that the only reason he won't release the Gaitchen's report is that it shows that for disgraced former Minister Mackenzie has been left to take the blame for a program that involved the Prime Minister, his office and senior members of his Cabinet? Senator uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr President. There is no clear precedent uh, in the form that uh, Senator Gallagher is uh, outlining. The clear precedent and the governments of both political persuasions, and uh, I can uh, provide the Chamber with a long list of quotes uh, from uh, Prime Minister Gillard, former Prime Minister Gillard Down uh, in the last period in the uh, Labor government. Uh, when the precise same uh, claim of public interest immunity in relation uh, to documents prepared for the consideration of cabinet or a cabinet subcommittee and which informed the deliberation of cabinet were exempt uh, from uh, public release. I mean, there, there are well-established uh, conventions in relation to this for good reasons and our government, in the same way as previous uh, Labor and coalition governments, is uh, absolutely acting consistent with those conventions. Senator Cormann. And with those few words, I ask that further questions be placed in a notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Stirl. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I do rise to take note of answers given by Senators Birmingham and Cormann to questions asked by Senators Smith and Sheldon. I don't know where to start, Madam, De Madam Deputy President. I don't know if I should be standing there with a top hat singing, uh, you know, like a uh, the circus leader. You know, gather around everyone. Was it roll up, roll up, roll up? Because I've got to tell you, I've got to say this very clearly. I have, in all the moons that I've served in here, I have not seen a situation that we find ourselves in the nation here today. Never ever before have I seen the coalition at each other's throats, whether it be over coal, whether it be over promotions, whether it be over leaderships, whether it be over rorts within the sports portfolio. And Senator Mackenzie's leaving. I've got to just got to say this. I reckon you're the fall guy, Senator Mackenzie. I honestly believe you're the fall guy. There is no way known that you acted on your own with those, with those coloured bits of paper to make sure that there was rotting through it. I've got to tell you right now, and I'll tell you how bad it's got. It's got that bad that all the Nats have been relegated down to this end of the chamber where even Senator Henderson gets promoted up. How bad are they going over that side? What an absolute, what an absolute rot. Oh, uh, Senator Stirl, please resume your seat. Love Senator to. Henderson. Thank you very much, um, Madam Deputy President. Uh, the, my point of order is that the, um, the senator has reflected on Senator Mackenzie in relation to her leaving the changer, which is uh, in defiance of the standing orders, and I would ask that he withdraw his comment and ensure that he doesn't reflect on her or any other senator in that way again. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. And uh, if you check the record, you'll see that I often remind uh, senators of that convention. It's not a standing order. And I would have reminded Senator Stirl at the conclusion of his uh, contribution. Please continue, Senator Stirl, and Madam bear Deputy in mind President, with pleasure, the because I don't have to defend anyone over there, because that just goes to show there is no coalition over there. What we have here, what we clearly have here in the rural and regional areas, and I think there are some decent people in, in the Nats. I think there really are some decent people who have come here to try and do good. The trouble is that the circus is being led by the clowns. Never before have we seen such white-hot anger. Never before have we seen the carry-on going on between the Nats and the Libs. And I honestly believe, Madam Deputy President and those others that are listening, that they may be tigers out there in the bush, but by crying out loud, they're pussycats when they come here to Canberra. 
The only thing that they will stand up and fight for is their own personal pay packet. And look at the choice that they have. The choice between Mr McCormack and I don't know where his friends come from, but he dug a few up the other day. But it's amazing, Madam Deputy President, what you can do to win a vote when you, have, when you get the opportunity to start offering ministries and assistant ministries. It's amazing how much they are at each other's throat. They hate each other. I don't know if that's the word I can use. I can't think of anything else. And there is a very famous saying in politics, a very famous saying, when you look at the carry-on between the libs and the nats, if you can't govern yourself, how the hell can you govern the nation? And the more you sit back and you tear each other apart, the more you have for, uh, the former leader the member for New England, Mr Joyce, proudly saying on one hand, if I'm called to arms, I'll stand up, busily working the phones, surprise, surprise, called to arms, couldn't even count 11. Now, I know unfairly Senator Cormann gets targeted as being the power broker and he couldn't get to that magical number, whatever it was in the Liberal Party at the time, but it was a lot more than 11. And then the next breath he says, I won't challenge again, I'm only interested in having a strong national party and we're in a coalition. How long did that last? 17 hours before the headline? Joyce and Cole, there was a breakaway group and what they're going to do to demand that coal, coal fired plants? What happened with the days when the good old country party used to stand up for farmers? Where is the good old country party, even as, far, even as close ago as Senator Boswell? when they actually stood up for Australia's food producers. Where are those country members now? They are long, long gone. There are a couple of members in the Nats who actually come here with dirt under the fingernails, and that's a nice thing to have because it's proved they've worked for a living. But by crikey, you're starting to fall into the same trap as the Libs. Go through university, go and work in a parliamentary office, run for the state secretaryship of your party or whatever it may be, come in here with no skills. I'm not looking at you. There's a couple of, I'm not looking at you two. You just happen to be there because the others <laughs> out of here like a rat up a drain. They've absconded. They've absolutely absconded because they fall into that trap. That they are ja well, you be careful too. You be very careful what you wish for, Senator, Senator Searle, Anderson. Address your but comments to well, the isn't, chair. That, isn't that amazing, you see? Because if they had that much unity and anger, where are you trying to get the pups back into the kennel? Where are you? <laughs> it's Order. just how can I get a promotion? Keep carrying on. Hey, I'm enjoying every bit. I just you know what I, I wish we you know how we've got Aussies here. I wish we had a popcorn vending machine. Because the entertainment, it shouldn't be. But there's so much entertainment, but at the same time, how embarrassing for this nation. And look at the stress of the, the hatred. I've just travelled the nation. I'm doing an inquiry into the Inland Rail. One minute, Mr Joyce, while he's trying to take out Mr McCormack about how great we've delivered the Inland Rail. Well, I've got to tell you, I went to just one town, Mill Merritt. There is nothing great about that. So you know what, Nats? I've got to tell you. Cut the, cut the umbilical cord. You know, don't worry, chuck the, while you're chucking the toys out the cot, this mob aren't your mates. This mob have no intention to look after rural and regional people. These people love your vote. You're going the wrong way. Thank you, Senator Still. Your time has expired. Senator Seselja. Uh, Deputy President, um, and it's, it's not often that I sort of give the Labor Party uh, free advice, uh, but I will, because as I sit here and I listened to Senator Stirl there and as, I, as we saw uh, the ridiculous line of questioning that we've seen uh, again today in the Senate, uh, that we've seen so many times uh, here, I, it, it is like deja vu all over again. It does feel like uh, 2018, 2017, 2016, 2015, 2014, going right back to the election of the coalition government in 2013, uh, where the Labor Party, uh, as we've seen in their question time strategy today, uh, believe that if they focus uh, on the insider yarns uh, that they're encouraged to take up uh, by the Twitterati and other parts of the commentariat, that that is a recipe for electoral success. Uh, that that is the way to win the hearts and minds of the Australian people. Uh, and it is this flawed strategy from the Labor Party of focusing not on the fundamentals, not on what's important to the Australian community, but on the insider nitpicking yarns that they believe is the pathway to electoral success. Well, I can tell you, Senator Stirl, and I can tell uh, Labor senators that we've seen this over the last 
six and a half years, uh, and it led them to a position where they received their lowest vote in 100 years. I wonder why that would be. I wonder why that would be. I mean, it used to be Sam Dastyari who used to come in here and play these games. You know, we've said I haven't been here that long—six and a half years, a little under. Uh, you know, to have Senator Stirl uh, lecturing the National Party and the Liberal Party on the diversity of experience uh, from coming from coming from the Labor Party. I mean, I'm reminded of Martin Ferguson's words when it came to Labor senators, uh, how you know, they, would, they would find a place for the underperforming uh, union hacks uh, somewhere in the upper house if they couldn't get them anywhere else. So uh, let's not be lectured by the likes of Senator Stirl on diversity uh, when it comes to political parties. But let's be clear for those who are listening and those who are watching. Uh, you, you, are, you are correct, Senator Stirl, union thugs. I, I stand corrected and I take the interjection. I thank Senator Stirl for the interjection. Uh, but let, let's be clear on, on what's actually at stake and some of the things that we are actually debating. Some of the things we are actually debating. Uh, Miss, sorry, Miss 26 per cent, Senator Keneally. Was it 26 per cent you got in New South Wales? I can't remember. You might be able to, you might be able to clarify the worst uh, election result for New South Wales Labor under your leadership. But we'll, we'll come back to the fundamentals. We'll come back to the fundamentals. And the fundamentals are about strong economy, about border protection. Uh, you know, so, sorry, Senator Keneally, I couldn't hear the interjection. What was it about New South Wales? Was it, was it Eddie O'Bead? I can't Order. remember. Who was, it, who was it in New South Wales you're talking about? I mean, I, I, am, trying, I am trying, Deputy President, but it's, it's hard to hear myself over the interjections about New South Wales Labor. But why don't they want to ask questions about the economy? Well, they took a plan, they took a plan to the last election for $387 billion of extra taxes. And as we respond to some of the challenges that we face, as we respond to the bushfire crisis, and when they finally got to a question around the bushfire crisis, uh, they didn't go into the overall response. Uh, they tried to just play word games with what the minister had said. They didn't go into the fact that we are delivering 6,500 personnel on the ground, $1,000 per eligible adult, $800 per eligible child. $52.6 million paid out across 44,000 claims, the Australian Government Disaster Recovery Allowance, payments to volunteer firefighters, $75,000 recovery grants to primary producers, $50,000 grants to affected businesses, $500,000 loans. The, the list goes on. And the reason we can do that is because we have focused on the fundamentals. Unlike the Labor Party, we have focused on the fundamentals. A strong economy, strong budgetary management, making sure we get the policies right. And as we debate the future of our nation, if the Labor Party's pathway forward is to continue with the insider nitpicking, then they will continue to get the same results. And the Australian people will see what the Labor Party are about. When it comes to the Liberal and National Government, uh, we are about delivering a strong economy, a safe Australia, a prosperous Australia, and the services that they deserve, which we can deliver because of our strong budgetary and economic management, something those across the thank aisle you, could Senator only Sister, dream of. Your time has expired, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President. Well, over the past couple of weeks, we've had an absolute masterclass from this government in what they're calling today insider nitpicking. Uh, we've had a masterclass uh, in chaos from this government. We've had an absolute masterclass in division. Uh, we've had a masterclass in instability. Uh, and today, here in the Senate, uh, we've had a masterclass in spin, uh, because this government cannot admit that it just has no plan to take our country forward. Uh, and you have to ask, how can this government run the country in this state? How can they run the country when they cannot even run themselves. Uh, and let's uh, talk about the government's performance over the past uh, couple of weeks and in this chamber today. Uh, we have two New South Wales government members, Mr Zimmerman and Mr Sharma, say that it is not the government's job to fund a new coal-fired power station, uh, that they don't support it. Uh, and at the very same time, we have Senator Canavan, uh, and Mr Christensen from Queensland telling Queensland voters that the government is, in fact, funding a new coal-fired power station. 
Uh, then we come into the chamber today and we hear from the minister. We hear from Senator Birmingham and he says that, no, the government is not funding a coal-fired power station. Well, what is it? Which is it? Yes or no? Who knows? Uh, because this government is in absolute chaos. It is divided uh, and it has no plan to deal with the big issues that are facing our country today. Uh, and today we've had a member of the government describing uh, other members as toddlers having a tantrum. Uh, and I have to say we saw a bit of that in the chamber right here today. Uh, and yesterday their own former Prime Minister condemned the government's support for this new uh, proposed coal-fired power station. Uh, and yet then, on the other hand, uh, a Queensland senator calling renewable energy uh, the dull bludgers of the energy system. And of course, we could only be referring to Senator Canavan. So again, what is this government's plan? What is their policy? Do they support renewable energy or do they not support renewable energy? Uh, and let's talk about this feasibility, feasibil feasibility study. Uh, what is it actually about? Uh, this is $4 million of taxpayer money uh, on a study for a coal-fired power station uh, that no one in the private sector wants to touch. No one in the private sector wants to go anywhere near coal-fired power stations right now. Uh, so if the government uh, is uh, proposing to support this, what are they doing with our taxpayer money? If the private sector is not wanting to go anywhere near it, if they don't want to take the risk, then why risk our taxpayer money? Well, the answer uh, has been on show here today and it's been on show over the past couple of weeks uh, because what this feasibility study is is actually uh, just $4 million to shut up the climate deniers uh, that are in the coalition, that are in the government today. So chaos, division, instability, confusion, uh, different answers to the same question. Um, different points of view within the party. Uh, that is what this government is uh, putting on show for the Australian people right now, today. Uh, and the big problem for the Australian people right now uh, is that what this means is that government cannot deliver on the big challenges that are facing the country today. Uh, they just don't have a plan for anything. Um, their own MPs and senators, they're speaking out against their own leadership. We've had the Nationals in a leadership coup. Uh, just yesterday, we have the government losing uh, a vote, losing control in the House of Representatives uh, and losing an important position for the government. Um, they have no idea what is coming at them at the moment. So how is the government meant to be governing the country when they cannot even govern themselves? They like to talk about the economy. Where is your plan? Where is your plan for the economy? They don't have a plan for the climate. They don't have a plan to tackle energy prices or the cost of living. They do not have a plan to take Australia forward because they are so focused on themselves, their own internal divisions, their own chaos, that they cannot deliver what Australians need Thank today. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Your time has expired. Senator Stoker. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, look, it's really quite interesting to stand up here and take note today and hear people go on and on about, about division and conflict and leadership and so forth. They think that if they just say it often enough, then it will become so. But it just isn't that way at all. And in fact, I find it quite disturbing that those opposite have a culture that finds it so unhealthy, so unusual for people to think for themselves, to debate among themselves and to try and work together to come up with new ideas. In fact, I would like to hope that when each and every one of those people opposite put their hand up to come to parliament, they might have thought, even just for a moment, boy, I'd like to contribute some ideas. Boy, I'd like to bring my life experience and my learning and my ideas and my community's perspectives into the parliament, debate it with my colleagues, so together we can come up with a great, refined, fabulous policy. But instead, 
Those on the other side come in here and go, yes, I want to be a robot who doesn't think for themselves, who doesn't debate with colleagues. In fact, in question time yesterday, we even had those opposite criticise a member of the Senate team here in the government for having an open mind. Can you believe it? What treachery, what heresy for a person to have an open mind, to think for themselves, to consider the evidence on its merits, to consider it using that good brain the good Lord gave them and to reach conclusions based on the evidence. Isn't that an extraordinary thing? And yet those opposite now think that's a heresy. The people of Australia should be horrified. They should be horrified to hear that those opposite have a problem with open-mindedness, have a problem with thinking, have a problem with debate and have a problem with people bringing their varied experience and ideas and the perspectives of the different communities they come from into this place to make up a healthy broad church where we work through the problems together. And you know what? That's exactly what we're doing. Senator Walsh, in what was um, a very good-natured display, said, you know, we have, we have no plan to take a country forward. Where is your plan? Well, thank you for the invitation, Senator Walsh, because we have an outstanding plan that we are delivering day in, day out for the Australian people. And I don't have enough time to go through all of it, but let's get cracking so we can get through some of the gems, because unlike smashing Australians, with $387 billion worth of new taxes, we're all about getting more opportunity into the lives of Australians. We're all about getting more money in the pockets of Australians because, you know what, they know what to do with it. Not big governments far away in Canberra, but Australians know what they want to do with their money. So let's, let's get into it because we have given 8.1 million hard-working Australians around $6.1 billion in additional income. Now, this isn't a gift from government. This is allowing Australians to keep more of what they earn and what they deserve because they know what they need to do with it. We're not about redistribution. We're about reward for effort. And so when Australians work hard, when Australians um, want to deliver for their families, we want to deliver for them too. And so we give them more of their money back in their pockets. And it has flow-on effects, Madam Deputy President. The flow-on effects are more ability for people to spend in their local communities, more growth for local businesses, more jobs, and that is a virtuous cycle we just love here on the government side of the chamber. We are always working hard to make sure Australians are getting ahead every day of the week. That's why we're so focused on jobs. You know, there has been over $1.3 million, a million dollars, million new jobs, Madam Deputy President, um, created by the private sector in the term of this government. It's an enormous number of new real jobs. And we won't stop. We will keep on going because Australians depend on it for their livelihood. That's how we give them choice. It's how we give them the freedom to live a life of their own design, to reach their goals, to reach their potential, Madam Deputy President. Because we know big governments can't design, can't um, demand with its um, pulling of levers the perfect life for all people. That's something that can only be determined in the heart of the individual. And so you know what? We're putting the tools back in the hands of Australians so they can design their perfect life with their money and their time and their family and a whole lot less of the interfering, we know best approach that Order. we get from those opposite. Senator Stoker. Senator Sheldon. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, what an interesting, interesting debate. Now we're hearing about all the things that the government's doing. And yet they're spending their entire time fighting each other. Now we just had the comments from Senator Gorman earlier, quite rightly. In actual fact, I agree with Senator Gorman, and that is that Senator Canavan got it wrong when he said renewables are the dull bludgers of the energy system. So we've got a unity ticket on his side. We actually think that comment's stupid. We actually have the minister for the prime minister, the speaker on behalf of the prime minister, also thinks it's stupid. But the Liberal and National Party are fighting it out. They're boxing it out. And why is it so important, the fact that they're boxing it out? Because the economy is in some serious trouble. Just reported this week, or late last week, 29 per cent of creditors 
the increase in the number of people that are not paying creditors has jumped by 29 per cent. 64 per cent of defaults have increased this year in the transport industry in 19, 2019. In 2019, health care has gone up 79 per cent. The economy is in trouble. And this is not post-coronavirus. It's not post the bushfire challenges. This is the problems that have existed because this government is in an absolute mess. Now, we heard a comment before about robots. I think what we're seeing across the other side of the chamber, chamber are robot wars. They're battling out amongst each other, trying to tear each other's arm off, rather than trying to get the economy to start ticking over in a fashion that everyone needs. You know, we see wages growth is not moving. We see there's no plan to deal with systematic wage and superannuation theft. We see chronic underemployment. Over two million Australians can't get the hours that they're seeking. There's no plan for the economy. There's no plan for energy. But there's a plan for the robots how to bash each other up and tear each other's arms off. Because unfortunately, we're seeing it day in and day out. You know, the former leader of the National Party, Tim Fisher, well, I think universally people think he was a pretty good bloke. He's pretty admired right around the country. And I think his wife has also been greatly admired. And according to reports today, it was her pleas for unity at the current embattled leader, Michael McCormick, was forced to deliver to the divided coalition room. She had told Mr McCormick that her husband would want us all to stand firm together. Well, that's an obvious point because the challenges in the economy are significant, and yet the government's spending its time tearing itself apart. To see the National Party holding a vote for leader, a vote for deputy leader, on the same day that we're giving condolences to many of their own constituency and many for all of us Australians that have fought on behalf of so many others and put their lives on the line and sometimes lost them is an absolute tragedy. We have to be turning around and looking at the sorts of changes that we can make together. But I'd say this to the coalition first of all. Can you start working out what you're going to do rather than spending your time beating the living daylights out of each other? Because just like Minister Cormann, I agree with him. We have to have a position to make a difference in this parliament, not just an opportunity to watch the other side turn around and tear itself apart. I know in the trucking industry when you have this amount of defaults and creditors, it means that people start losing jobs and the government's got no plan. I know when there's wage freezes and underemployment that people can't provide for the families. But you've got no plan. I see when there's $6 billion being ripped off in the Australian community and billions of dollars in superannuation and wages, and you've got no plan to recoup it. It's quite clear this government all it has is a plan on how to beat the living daylights out of each other. We've seen this time and time again. And I see that when we get recited the sorts of opportunities, we saw the divisions in the Abbott when he was Prime Minister. We saw the divisions when Turnbull was Prime Minister. In actual fact, we're reminded by Senator Cormann about his time in the Turnbull government. Well, we're finding the exact similar issues fighting right now at a time of crisis when we need to be making sure that this country is put first and the divisions within your government Order. within Senator your party Sheldon, changes. Time for the contribution has expired. The question is the motion moved by Senator Still be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you. I wish to take note of Minister Rustin's answers, um, answer to my question. Uh, questions on the opt-out provisions for the cashless debit card. Now, just to remind the chamber, these are the provisions that were agreed to by the government as a deal with the um, uh, ALP um, when the last the, the last expansion of the trials was put through this place. The opt-out provisions were put in place, and just to remind the chamber, they didn't originally work. The government had to come back and alter those provisions. These are so that a person can apply to exit 
the cashless debit card if they can demonstrate reasonable and responsible management of their fares, including financial affairs, in accordance with the criteria set out in the legislation. Now, the problem here was that criteria was always set at a level that was going to make it extremely difficult for people to get off the card, and that's quite obvious what is happening. According to the latest data, which is of, as of December the 31st, that's available from the Department of Social Services via the government, the data government um, website, says there's been 635 people have applied. Number of applications, and they're listed from different areas, um, 226 from Bundaberg, uh, 196 from the Goldfields region, 44 from East Kimberley, 21 from Sejuna, and 148 from out of area. It says approved. None. Not approved. None. So the minister was technically correct when she said, oh, but we haven't said no to anyone. But the fact here is that they have not said anything. Fair enough, the renewed process didn't actually kick in once the kinks were ironed out to actually make the thing work. didn't kick in until early September. But the fact is that was four months ago, five months ago, and we still haven't seen anybody being able to exit this pro program. Now, the minister said they're complex provisions. Yeah, they are complex, which we said at the time, designed, in my opinion, to make sure people couldn't get off. She said, and then went to blame the state and territory. So now, of course, Commonwealth Standard, tick, use the complex excuse. Now we'll use the state and territory's excuse. The fact is, you don't want people to be able to access the, exit the cashless debit card. These are people that are going to have to jump through hurdles so high, find documentation which at the time we said was going to be extremely hard to find, to find that documentation, to be able to get the people to support um, you to be able to make that application is extremely difficult. You've got to remember that many of these 635 people actually started applying and ringing about this before July last year, when the provisions were supposed to kick in. So not only have they been waiting since the form actually technically became available, they've been waiting for months and months prior to that. So for almost a year now, some of these people who have applied will have been waiting for almost a year to get off the cashless debit card. I asked, and the minister did not answer the question about local partners. Now, what people have to do is they also have to go into the local partners. And my argument there is very strongly that it could be argued there is a conflict of interest with these local partners because it's in their interest to keep people on the cashless debit card. The government wants to keep people on the cashless debit card. So, is anybody really surprised out there that the government hasn't exited anyone? In fact, they haven't dealt with any of this. So, my questions. And these will um, be raised during estimates, so heads up to the government. Just how many people in the Department of Social Services are actually working on this exit, on this exit process? When there's 635 applications, just how many are working to make this process work? How long have some of these applications been in? What qualifications do the Department of Social Services, the staff working on there, to deal with what the minister herself said are very complex provisions? Given the high proportion of First Nations peoples on the card, what proportion um, or, or resources are being made available in remote communities to enable people to be able to access the form properly, to be able to fill in the form properly, make sure it's culturally specific, uh, sensitive, make sure it's in language for those whose first uh, language is their own language and English could be either their third or fourth language. What other resources is the government investing in making sure that people with low literacy and numeracy um, levels are being able to access and make these uh, applications? My question also is how many of these applications have not been filled in to what the, what the department thinks is the standard required because the form is not adequately accessible for people whose English is not, for whom English is not their first language? Question this is, all those is Senator Seawitt, time for the contributions expired. The question is the motion moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now move on to petitions. I call the clerk.